Okay. Uh, I did want to follow up a little bit with last week because I know Lynette had sent me some questions about forgiveness. And of course, that was one of the petitions that we had last week. And I was just wondering, is there any follow-up questions that either of you had about um, having to forgive one another, how difficult that is, and just that whole thing of forgiveness? Lynette, I know you had several questions you sent me. I was actually in Florida. Oh, are you? Okay. Them. I didn't have a chance to respond. I was only there for three or four days. Just enough time to catch some cold on the airplane and come home, so oh. it is always nice. Yeah. So the the particular one that we were looking at was the fifth petition uh, about forgive us our sins. That's not this week; it's last week. So I just wonder if there was any follow up uh, as we forgive those who sin against us. Um, Luther, of course, points out that we're not worthy to have our sins forgiven, and yet they are, and therefore we ought to be able to forgive other sins. And I know Lynette had raised, raised the question, and I've certainly, you know, tossed this around myself. I know those talked about it. You know, how do we forgive the people who have intentionally done repeated horrible things and sort of what I would describe as the great monsters of history? Um, you know, your Adolf Hitlers, your Idi Amin's. Why are they all men, by the way? Have you ever noticed that? Um, but these people who have used their power and influence to kill people. Uh, like the Holocaust, et cetera, and, and even other people. How do we forgive them for that? And I think that, that the way that I understand it, and I don't know if this is helpful, is that the truth of the matter is all of us are in this pool of, according to Luther, of not being worthy of forgiveness, every last one of us. And so because of that, our ability to forgive doesn't come from some magical um, potion to, or some special blessing that we have. It's just that we're able to forgive others of the worst possible sins because all of us don't measure up. And so whether, you know, you're Mother Teresa or whether you're Adolf Hitler, uh, nobody completely uh, is, in, is, is in need of, is, deserves forgiveness. And therefore all of us do. And if all of us do, that includes the worst person and the best person. Does that make some sense, Lynette? Or did you guys get mm -hmm. a chance to talk about that? Well, I, I mean, God forgives everyone, but it's hard for right. us to. It is hard for us to, right. And I think what Luther is trying to get us to think about is that if we can somehow understand that we're forgiven, even though we don't deserve it, that may be fuel for us to be able to forgive others, even though they don't deserve it. Do you see what I mean? They may not deserve it from us. But one of the things that is troubling is that when we don't forgive sins, we're also holding those things not only against ourselves, but against those other people. And that also is not healthy, that inside those things that we haven't forgiven are also eating at us. I think um, a few years ago, for I had never read it in college or, um, or high school, even though I was an English major. But uh, we read in book club Nathaniel Hawk Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. And basically what's going on there is the, the person who is accused of adultery is having that affair with the pastor of the community. If you've read the book, are, are you familiar with it? Mm -hmm. Lynette yeah. or Pete, have you ever read it? Yes. But that sin <laughs> way, way back. Is, <laughs> way, way back. But that sin that he is holding is literally eating him alive. Uh, because he allows her to be punished for her sins, knowing all along that the child she has and the adulterer she has is in fact with him. And he's sort of leading that charge against her, as it were. And yet, because he's not able to either forgive her or to forgive himself, it becomes sort of a cancer within him as well, uh, which is what Hawthorne talks about in, in the book. And I think that when we have the ability to forgive other people, understand that we're forgiven, we have ability to forgive, it also can get that cancer out of our hearts. And the other thing is that it doesn't mean as human beings that we always forget. Because I don't think as human beings it's possible for us to forget somebody who has sinned deeply against us. But I do think it's possible to forgive them. Um, have you ever noticed sometimes when 
a family speaks at a trial where someone is convicted of murdering their daughter or somebody, some of those families do have the courage to say, we forgive the person for doing it. But I don't think they're also interested then in letting the person not pay the punishment for the crime that they committed in this life. Do you know what I mean? Although sometimes they don't want them to be put to death. You know, they, they may be against capital punishment. They may forgive them from their hearts, but still understand that there's consequences in this life for things that happen. Does that help at all, or how are we doing? A lot of people think that when you forgive the sin, you forgive the you don't have they don't have to pay anything for it, any punishment. And sometimes it's true. Sometimes you can let people go, but other times they have to serve their punishment, whatever well, it is. In this world. Well, the other thing, in this world, and the other thing, sometimes there are consequences to the sin. You know, if a drunk driver kills a family, and one of those family members is one of your loved ones, you know, that there's a consequence to that sin. Yes, they may not be sentenced to hell, eternal punishment for having done that. But at the same time, in this world, there are still consequences. So it's possible that we could forgive somebody who did something so heinous against us or against our family, but at the same time realize there's consequences in this world, but not for eternal life. God can even forgive those sins and bring mm -hmm. us into new reborn relationships. Okay. Yeah. My uh my thing with forgiveness is is I'm never quite sure. I mean you forgive them for doing a thing, but if it's something it's somebody has hurt you over and over the same way do you have to then do you have to keep putting them in a position where they can repeat that or can you say no, no. Look, get away from me right. because i know you're going yes, to do it I again think, well and i think that's the intelligent thing to do i mean if you think an example let's say of a, a husband beating a wife she may still love him and forgive him for having done it but to constantly put herself in that situation where she can be abused i don't think is what God wants her to do. I think if anything, God wants her to get out of that situation. And if we know someone who has wronged us repeatedly or has done something that they can't be trusted doing, you know, we're not being wise as serpents, as innocent as doves at that point. Uh, we've got to learn. So for instance, if we know someone steals all the time, we're not going to have them collect the Sunday offering, right? It, now, it doesn't mean we think they're going to hell. It means that we have information in this world to protect both them and ourselves, and that we ought to use that. Uh, that that's learning, and I, I think sometimes we in this in this world we have to learn. Now, in the kingdom of God, they will also be forgiven and renewed, so that they don't have to get, you know, their worth of life by stealing or whatever you know joy they get out of that or, or whatever reason they have to do that. Um, that won't be necessary in the kingdom of heaven either. So those things, will, they will change um, as well. They will be different in the kingdom of heaven. But on this earth, yeah, there's things we need to learn from. Absolutely. You know that old saying, it's like, uh, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice. I mean, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Because I let you do it the second time. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. It's still hard. <laughs> That's why we have the confession every week. It's still hard. It's not easy. Uh, but we try to live in new ways. So let, let's move on then to uh, the sixth petition and the conclusion, which we have today. I'm sorry, seventh <laughs> petition and the conclusion. If I get it straight here. We're on page 120. And of course, uh, this um, the petition is, and deliver us from evil. Um, you know, we throughout this book, I think I've repeated over and over again that Luther believed there was evil in the world, uh, that, that sin and evil were real, that the devil was real. And he talks a lot about that in his writing. And, uh, of course, we see this here. He calls it in this prayer, uh, when at last uh, grant us a blessed end, take us by grace from this valley of tears. Um, you know, there's ways in which we separate ourselves from the reality of death today. There's many ways that we do this. Um, yesterday, I had a funeral up in the Toledo area, a burial at a big cemetery. I've been there many years ago. Uh, but when we went there, they were just going to put 
the urn in the ground. It wasn't a casket. She had been cremated. But even there, when we went to the graveside, even though they had dug the hole, they placed all this plastic grass over it. And then they had a box that had this artificial grass on it on which they placed the urn. <laughs> and the family that I was with actually wanted to stay while they actually put the earth in the ground. I mean, put the urn into the ground, into Mother Earth. And I think, so, I don't know why we have this penchant at graveyards to put tents up in grass. It's it's the earth. That's what we're going back to. And if I if I were in charge of cemeteries, I'd strip all that grass out of there and say, they're going right here. And the other mm -hmm. problem is when they put that grass over the hole, you can't see where it is. So then there's the possibility, and I have seen this happen, where somebody slips in it a little bit or gets their foot caught in it. I'd rather they just have the hole have it marked, but we're going to be lowering this casket putting this urn in the ground, back to Mother Earth, where we come from. It, there's no um, horribleness about that. But when we put all this plastic grass up, we sort of, we're in denial that in fact, that's what's happening. We, I think everybody knows what's happening. Let's just do it. And so they waited and they pulled the plastic grass aside and they put the urn in the ground and they shoveled the earth on the ground and put the sod back on it. And that was that. So, but in some ways, and I did not, you know, they had the choice of doing what they wanted. I didn't encourage them to do it's what they wanted. But there was, there's a certain reality to death that sometimes we want to deny. Uh, and of course, in, in this chapter talks about the plague, uh, which was ravishing Europe during these times. I, it's an interesting picture of that plague mask. Did you see that? Uh, mm -hmm. Pete Nevelin, did you see that? In the, where they used to, in that long nose of the bird, they used to put pleasant odors to keep you from sniffing it up. Um, they thought, of course, it was from the vapors that people were catching it. We learned later the plague was actually spread by fleas from mice and other, or fleas that had bit people. And so they didn't realize it was actually the insects that were spreading it. Um, and some people got it and some people didn't, uh, just like anything. But uh, here you can see that. I always, I always thought that those masks looked pretty bizarre. And, and if you're in that, situation where people are dying all around you and there's people walking around with these bird heads on i would find it oh. a little scary a little <laughs> yeah. i think a lot scary yeah i mean i would not feel comforted to have the bird man of alcatraz there or whatever that is visit me <laughs> no. yeah absolutely so but this but the idea of death and dying i mean obviously we know that people die today everybody dies today but i think medical care is better today and we, and you know, in, in we can live a long life, and you know, sometimes at the end of life, we understand people are going to die. But in Luther's day, there were very few people who didn't know death up front. I mean, they came from agrarian societies; they saw animals die, the plague would come through, women died during childbirth, uh, children died during childbirth, children sometimes didn't live very long; they were susceptible. You know, our health care has gotten a lot better, but of course, not completely. We still, death is still real, but certainly Luther and others, that death was very real and also evil. I mean, the ability for people to kill one another thing was, was more real. Of course, it happens today, turn on the news, Ukraine, shooting, et cetera. But um, uh, Luther had a very strong sense of that. Mm -hmm. what was going on. Okay. Any questions about the delivering us from the evil around us? And of course, they they note the hymn Mighty Fortress there. And those are the actual words of Luther there on page 121. We, 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 we've changed them slightly for the hymn, but you can still get the sense of it. Uh, then we have the conclusion to the Lord's Prayer. And I think many of you know this was not included. It's not in any biblical version, either Matthew or Luke, uh, of the Lord's Prayer. It was something to add with later. And to this day, many Catholics don't <coughs> include this conclusion. So if you're ever at a Roman Catholic church and you're praying the Lord's Prayer, you're immediately going to tell yourself, you're immediately going to be pointed out as a Protestant if you say this last <laughs> bit. Because they do not say, for thy is the kingdom of power and glory. Okay, they don't say that yeah. part of the prayer. And I, I know when I was growing up in, in the Methodist church, they said that, but not exactly in that order. They said, yours are... This is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And I don't remember if they said forever or not. Um, yeah. It was the same sentiment, but it worded a little bit differently. 
you know, we say forever and ever, so we used to, secula seculorum in the Latin. But yes, and of course, it's just a way of saying, yes, this is true. And, and Luther so, sort of knows that. Okay. But one of, one of the things that I thought we might do today, just do you have anything on these last two? It's pretty small, just a couple of pages today. One of the things I think is interesting is if you look on page 122 in that little gray box, I want to read that and then I want to look at these passages because they're sort of, they're very interesting. So I thought we could spend the rest of our time uh, that we have tonight doing that. But if you see where I'm on page 122, where you have that little gray box up there, you with me? Yes. Yeah. It says <clears throat> repeatedly, Luther expressed his confidence that God hears our prayers. He saw in the stories of the Bible the evidence that God wants us to pray and will answer us. Writing in 1541 in his appeal for prayer against the Turks, Luther reminded his readers that though they may not be the patriarchs of the Old Testament, nevertheless, they can pray just as those figures did. True enough, we're not a Joshua who through a prayer could command the sun to stand still, nor are we a Moses who through his fervent plea separated the waters of the Red Sea. Neither are we an Elijah who by his prayer called down fire from heaven. They are at least the equal of those to whom God gave his word and whom the Holy Spirit has inspired to preach. Yes, we are no different than Moses, Joshua, and Elijah, and all the other saints, because we have the same word and spirit of God that they had. They were humans just as we are, and we we're created by the same God. And God must answer our prayer just as much as theirs, for we are members of his church. Okay, this idea of praying fervently, asking God for what you need. But I want to take a look at these references that he makes. So do you have your Bibles handy there? Mm -hmm. So let's look first, just to put it in chronological order, we're, we'll take first Moses, and then Joshua comes after Moses, then Elijah. So if you look at, where did I put my Bible? Here we go. Let's look at Exodus chapter 14. And this is the famous parting of the Red Sea. <clears throat> and let's actually start up in verse 10. And this is uh, just to set the stage here. Um, Moses has taken the people of Israel out of Egypt. They've gathered their things together. They hurried out. They didn't even let their bread rise. Uh, it was unleavened bread, and they made their way, and all of a sudden they get to the Red Sea. Well, now they're stuck because the armies of Egypt with Pharaoh are behind them, and in front of them, they're up against the sea, so they can't move, all right? So let's look at verse 10 of chapter 14. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. You know, this is, to me, this is very reminiscent of the time that Peter tries to walk on the water. And as long as he looks at Jesus, he's fine. But the minute he looks away or at the sea, he starts to sink. And here the Israelites are, they're following Moses. But the minute they look back, all of a sudden they're terrified, right? In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us? Bring us out of Egypt. Is not this the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. Of course, they never said that. They wanted to be free. For it would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to them, do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still, okay? So quit belly aching. God is going to save us. But they didn't it's quit hard to do that when you, look, yeah, <laughs> when you look back and you see the dust of the chariots coming towards you. So then the Lord said to Moses, all right? Now, Luther says this is a prayer of Moses, sort of interesting. Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. But you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, 
that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And so I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his armies, chariots and his chariot drivers. If you've ever thought about this, God is actually setting a trap for the Egyptians. Isn't mm -hmm. that what's happening? Right? You go ahead, and when they come into the trap, I will spring it. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, Yahweh, when I have gained glory for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. So verse 19. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelites' army, moved and went behind them. Okay, so you see what happened in here? Now, at least between the Israelites and the Egyptian is this pillar of this cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. It's standing between them. The pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness. It lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. So do you see what's happening? Mm -hmm. God separates them and doesn't let the Egyptians catch them. All right. Then verse 21. Now, what's curious about this, it, it isn't this way in the Hollywood, Holly, Hollywood version, but does it happen during the day or during the night? Is it meant to be morning? Is it light yet? It's not particularly clear, is it? Well, it, it says a strong east wind all night. Right. So maybe the night was over. I don't know. But anyway. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went to the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on the right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued. So, I mean, here's the other question I've always said. Now, did the cloud move out of the way? Did it go back to the front of the line? Where did the cloud go? You with me? Doesn't say. Yeah. The Egyptians pursued, and they all went into the sea after them, all the Pharaoh's horse chariots and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, which is very early in the morning, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptians into panic. So what seems to have happened is this east wind blows it dry all night so they can get across. Once they get across, the cloud sort of lifts. The Egyptians follow them, and it's as if this cloud of the Lord is hanging over them and then it comes down upon them to make a mess of things. And then the Egyptians say, let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Okay? And then God has Moses stretch his hand back over the sea so the waters may come back upon the Egyptians. And it does. Now, my question is, Luther raises this up as an act of prayer. Where are you seeing prayer in here? It seems more like he's commanded to do these things. His right? action. But right. by holding his it's arm a, out all night long, it had to have been a prayer in there. Right, I guess, yeah. I mean, well, the Israelites cry out, like, why'd you do this? Then Moses and God talk, and then God says, Moses, you do this. Maybe that's the prayer part of it, the conversation. Yeah, but, I think it's kind of think... implied because God right. says, you why are you coming to me with this you do this here and it'll so i think there must have been some right. prayer at that point saying god please help us right and and luther is using this to tell his people that trust that god can do wonderful things through you you mean as as god helped moses we're gonna look at joshua and then elijah that god can also do those things through you Interesting, don't you think? When's the last time you've heard of someone raising up their hand and, part, and parting the seas? <laughs> Elijah does it with his mantle from last Sunday, if you caught that. But it hasn't happened a lot in history, has it? Where the hand of a human being, a prophet, has held up to attack the enemy. or I, I can't think of too many times this has ever happened. And yet Luther says... We ought to be asking God to help us in some ways. Like Moses made the sea dry. By the way, one of my favorite hymns is Come Ye Faithful, Raise the Strain. Because in the final verse of that hymn, it says, Led them with unmoistened foot through the Red Sea waters. 
I've, <laughs> I've always loved that. But again, it's almost as if Luther is saying that prayer is an actionable thing. Mm -hmm. It's something we do with God's behalf to, to create an outcome, right? Mm -hmm. But something physically done almost. He lifts up this one, okay? Keep that in mind. And now let's move to Joshua. So I'm going through them in order here, although Luther says Joshua, Moses, Elijah, but it's Joshua 10. Joshua 10, verses 12 to 13. But I also just want to set the tone here. So I want to look at Joshua 10, verse 1. Because there's actually a lot of different battles going on at this point. This is the po point where Joshua and his army are trying to go in and take the Holy Land. Okay, they've been in captivity for 40 years. They're now going into the... The Holy Land, of course, they're meeting resistance by different kings, and the Lord is with them to help them to victory. You with me? Let's look at chapter 10. I'm going to buzz through some of these names because they're just difficult. So chapter 10 of Joshua. When King Adonizedek of Jerusalem heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gideon, Gibeon, had made peace with Israel were among them, he became greatly frightened because Gibeon was a large city, like one of the royal cities, and was larger than I, and all its men were warriors. So King Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem, which by the way, Zedek is faithfulness. So his name actually means the Lord is faithful, Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem, sent a message to King Hoham of Hebron, to King Piram of Jarmuth, to King Jaffa of Lachish, and to King Debir of Eglon, saying, come and help me. Let us attack Gibeon. Let's join together. For it has made peace with Joshua and with the Israelites. So they were afraid. They wanted to try to pick off the Gibeonites before Joshua joined with them. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, king of Hebron, king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered their forces and went with all their armies and camped against Gibeon and made war against it. The Gibeonites, who had made a league with Joshua, sent to Joshua at the camp in Gilgal, saying, Do not abandon your servants. Like we have this partnership. We're in NATO together. Are you with me? Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the king of the Amorites who live in his, the hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went up, went up from Gilgal. He and all the fighting force with him, all the mighty warriors. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them. For I have handed them over to you. Not one of them shall stand before you. Again, I just want to point out that in both these cases that Luther cites, it seems like God is talking to them. God telling them to do this. Are you with me? As opposed mm -hmm. to them praying. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having much marched up all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who inflicted a great slaughter on them at Gibeon, chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Horon and struck them down as far as Azekah and Makedah as they fled before Israel while they were going down the slope of Beth Horon. And here's an interesting thing. The Lord threw down huge stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstone than the Israelites killed with the sword. So we've had two stories here. In the first one, Moses, God kills the Egyptians by pulling them into the trap that God has set. And here, God kills the Amorites, who are against the Gibeonites and against Joshua, by throwing hailstones of, from heaven. In fact, here it notes that what God threw from them in heaven was worse than being killed. You with me? God is mm -hmm. acting in both of so, verse 12, on the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, Joshua spoke to the Lord, so here comes the prayer, and he said in the sight of Israel, sun stands still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon, 
and the sun stayed still and the moon stopped until the nations took vengeance on their enemies. Okay, that's the story. Why Why does Joshua want the, 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 the sun to stop? What's the point there? Do you get it? It's to make the day longer so he can kill more people. <clears throat> so they have the advantage. The Lord, the king of the Amorites have come. They've joined together to go against the Gibeonites. Joshua comes up from Gilgal, throws them into panic. The Lord stones them from heaven. Then Joshua, because now they have the advantage. So imagine here's Israel and the Gibeonites are stuck. In, I mean, the Amorites are stuck in the middle. Joshua wants the sun to stop so that there will be more time to kill all of them. You with me? What's going on here? Nice, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. But this is the story. And again, Luther cites these two stories as examples of how our forebears prayed and God did things for them. Now remember, if you remember what I read to you, this was in a letter against the Turks, okay, that he doesn't exactly like. And he wants God to do to the Turks what Moses did to the Pharaoh and what Joshua, by stopping the sun, did to the Amorites. Not exactly nice, is it? <laughs> and then one more example, just to mess with you a little, a little bit more. We're now going to go a little bit further. We're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 1. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 1. <clears throat> By the way, just a little comment here, a little side comment. I don't know if you know this or not, but in the Hebrew Bible, both Chronicles and Kings are just one. Chronicles is one book. Kings is one book. Uh, we separated it out between First and Second Kings in the Christian Bible. The Jewish Bible doesn't have it that way. I'm not sure why we did it, but we broke Kings into First and Second Kings. Just a side there. All right. So if you look at Second Kings chapter 1, now, this is how does Elijah call upon the Lord, okay? Verse 1 of 2 Kings. After the death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against Israel. Moab would be modern-day Syria or Jordan, you know, across the, across the Jordan here. Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice in his upper chamber in Samaria and lay injured. So he sent messengers telling them, go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. This is the king, one of the kings of Israel. He's asking a Sumerian god whether he's going to recover. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, get up, go to meet the messenger of the king of Samaria and say to them, is it because there's no god in Israel that you're going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not live the bed to which you have gone, but you shall surely die. So Elijah went. So here's the king of Israel. He fell through during a battle. He fell through some lattice work, and he's wondering if he's going to live or not. He goes to consult the the non Lord, and Elijah hears of and says, "Well, now you're going to die because you didn't come to the real Lord." You with me? Mm -hmm. Another another banner day here in Israel, right? <laughs> the messengers returned to the king, who said to them, "Why have you returned?" They answered him, there came a man to meet us who said to us, go back to the king. Again, this is King Ahaziah. Go back to the king who sent you and say to him, thus says the Lord, it is because there is no God in Israel that you're sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron. Therefore, you shall not live the bed to which you have gone, but shall surely die. All right. So they go. Elijah tells them what's going to happen. They come back. They tell the king. The king says to them, verse 7. What sort of man who he was he who came to meet you and told you these things? They answered him, he was a hairy man with a leather belt around his waist. The king said, it is Elijah, the Tishbite. Then the king sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50 men. He went up to Elijah, who was sitting on top of the hill and said to him, O oh, man of God, the king says, come down. But Elijah answered the captain's 50, if I'm a man of God, let 
fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed his 50. Okay. Again, the king sent to him another captain of 50 with his 50. He went up and said to him, oh, man of God, this is the king's order. Come down quickly. But Elijah answered them, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Okay. Martin Luther, <laughs> in the large catechism, uh, in his works here, which we read today, he claims that in our prayers, we could be like these three people. We could be like Moses. We could be like Joshua. We could be like Elijah. Moses, who stretched his hand out of the water, the Israelites went through, lured the Egyptians in, and they all died. Joshua, who had the sun stop so he could finish killing the Amorites. And then Elijah, who was mad because the king didn't honor the king of kings, which would be God, Yahweh, went to another god, calls down fire from heaven to kill 50 people. Actually, it's 100 because he does it twice, right? Is this an odd sort of reference that Luther gives here? Do you think anybody looked up these passages when Luther said this? To say, what are you saying here? Are you saying that we ought to be against the Turks and hope that we can stretch out our arms and destroy them or call, call down fire from heaven? You, you with me here? Yeah, all, all three of these three. things are have to do with God killing your enemies. <laughs> right. Which doesn't, I mean, how does that play? I guess what I'm saying is I, I don't understand this this analogy at all. Because how does that deal with forgiveness of others? And so we ought to, to trust that God isn't on our side and just randomly kill whoever needs to be killed. I mean, part of the problem here is that it sounds like this is what modern day Israel is doing to Hamas, is it not? In yeah. spite of what the world is saying and let, let's let them alone they're going in and they're just bulldozing the place and killing everybody in sight sometimes even their own hostages right and now it appears they had all the palestinians civilians move to southern israel and now it appears they're gonna blow that place to kingdom come right along the border mm -hmm. it's just it's an odd thing i think to be so sure that God is on your side that you're going to unleash death on other people. It's, I think that's very dangerous. That's what I think. Thoughts? Objections? <laughs> Applause? What are you guys thinking? I'm trying to find the part. I think it's on page 120. Can you hear me? I don't know where the, yep. I don't know where the hand is to hand up. No, no, no. It's okay. I can hear you. Okay. On page 120. Yeah, when he says uh, towards the bottom, uh, we must pray against every form of evil and guard against it to the best of our ability. Uh, mm -hmm. And did not want us to sink into fatalism, but rather pray actively. There's another spot, too, where he says about right. praying, even though, you, even though you don't think it'll happen, to still pray fervently. Right. And to do something against it, it's, it's, it's curious. But part yeah. of the problem with using the Old Testament analogies, I think, is who, who, decides, who decides which people are evil and which people are godly? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think that's a modern day problem. Who, who decides? I mean, I mean, Hamas decided that what Israel had done for them for the last 25 years was so horrific that one day when they got the chance, they snuck out and killed, what was it, 1,200 people, something ridiculous, in horrible ways and took captives. I don't think anybody thought that was right, but it's what they did because they believed that's what God wanted them to do. Now, the Israelites believe that what God wants us to do is utterly destroy you. And anytime that you believe God is only on your side 
what I'm suggesting, and I'm suggesting for Luther too, against this war with the Turks and another war he has against the peasants. Whenever you decide God is only on your side, it's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And and it's not uncommon. It's not any different than jihad or what Islamic people have done against America. When you are so sure that God is only on your side and on no other, I think that's extremely dangerous. And I always want to hold back and say, are we that sure? Is this really what we're called to do? Are we called by God to wreak vengeance on those who we don't think are of God? That that's hard. I I don't know. I don't know. I I just I have a really tough time with that and with these Luther quotes as well in this particular section. I don't think the Lord's Prayer in the end justifies ourselves. I think it calls us up short and reminds us that God's in charge. And how do we align ourselves with that? And so I'm just sort of reacting to what this last little paragraph was here. So I think it's sort of out, out of step with the rest of the book. So. so those cheery thoughts I have for you today. Anybody have any follow-up questions or anything? No, well, you just get out kind of point out that, you know, that, that last, bit there with those three examples you know last year when we were doing the story we saw how much killing and death there was in the old testament and if you're going to use that as a model for how to live that's going to be tough right but the problem of course is that i think killing and death leads to more killing and death is the problem it doesn't lead to peace um, are you going to have a chance to get out for Ash Wednesday, Lynette? I'll probably go down the Roman Catholic Church. Okay. And do they yeah. do ashes there, I assume? Yeah, they do they ashes. Do ashes. It's just yeah, we do. Too. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. How's the weather up where you are? Well, we had some snow again, okay. but not all, not much. Okay. We, we have missed that. Every storm has gone the other way in Ohio this year. Yeah, like it either goes below us or above us. We we've gotten well, just a skiff of snow here and there, but not really much at all. We have nothing right now, so it's amazing. We've we've been very lucky here so far. <laughs> so, yeah, we only had, no we had a little bit, but Buffalo had a lot. And, mm. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Buffalo always has a lot. Yes, yeah. yeah. they're right on the lake. They get hammered. Yeah. So, the ski, ski right. slope. Well, yes, I want to remind you, we'll be here again next Tuesday. We start now with baptism. And of course, we're studying this here in the church during the Lenten season as well, uh, looking at baptism. And uh, hopefully other people will join us back, join back with us. And uh, but we'll be doing it around six o'clock. And I know I apologize today when I went to log on, I had to re-put in my, I don't know, if by Jenny using it last week and it messed with it, but I had to re-put everything in and wait for it to reload, then reload it. And so I was late getting started. So I apologize well, Pete for that. Now, Pete, I Pete, and I were Pete and I were talking. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, good. All right. Well, we'll end, end a little early this week, but uh, blessings to both of you. And Pete, I'll see you tomorrow for Ash Wednesday. In the evening, yeah. yeah. Well, all right. Well, we'll be here at noon, too, but I'll, I'll see you in the evening then. Yeah. All right. Blessings I'll be at work to both at of noon. you. Okay. Uh, so will I. <laughs> so blessings to both of you. We'll see you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye.